patriarchy, turf consciousness, warfare, city building, and so forth and so on. Well, it's a no-blame story. It's that the very dynamic processes which drove the arboreal apes out of the trees and into this paradisical symbiosis on the grasslands, which lasted 25, 30,000 years, the very forces which created that ambiance, which were climatological forces, the drying of the planet, destroyed that equilibrium paradise because the drying process did not halt. It continued. It accelerated. And as we all know, uh, today the Sahara Desert is one of the most inhospitable climates on Earth. I mean, it's a land of endless sand and fantastic high temperatures and no vegetation whatsoever to speak of. Nevertheless, there are archaeological sites out there which are the best evidence for this theory that I'm putting forward because in southern Algeria on the Tassili Plateau, there are uh, rock paintings dated from 12 to 15,000 years old that show shamans with mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies, unambiguous, because they're not simply being held in the hand. In some cases, when a mushroom-like object is held in the hand, and some anthropologists and art historians want to call it a chopper, but what do you do when there are mushrooms sprouting out of the body by the dozens? I mean, the, it becomes incontrovertible. So the archaeological evidence is there. The uh, primate behavior provides evidence for this. And what happened, I think, is that these orgies, which originally at the heyday of this uh, partnership society, these uh, group get-togethers were probably at the new and full moon. Well, then as the drying accelerated, they became merely lunar every 28 days instead of 14 days, and then ultimately seasonal or associated with only certain areas. The rainfall became sparser, and there became... Uh, strategies had to be developed then to spread fewer and fewer mushrooms over a wider and wider area. And I believe that uh, we can even, spec as long as we're loose in the realm of speculation, we might as well go whole hog. Uh, I think what probably happened, based on a fairly careful reading of the archaeological record out there, was that honey emerged as a very important part of this story. Because you see, if you don't have refrigeration, you can use honey to, ref to, to preserve delicate foods. And to this day, there are parts of Mexico where mushrooms are mixed into honey and then they, they don't uh, decay and can be used for many months. Now, the problem with this is that honey itself has the potential to undergo chemical change and turn itself into a psychoactive substance. But a psychoactive substance with a very different character than psilocybin. In, in other words, mead, alcohol, crude alcoholic beverages probably began with the fermenting of honey and fruit juices. Well, that puts you firmly in the domain of the messed up culture that we're in because I told you what the qualities of psilocybin were to promote visual acuity, sexual activity, religious experience, language. What are the qualities of alcohol? What does it do if viewed as a psychedelic drug? Well, it does two things. It lowers sensitivity to social cueing, and it empowers uh, aggressive behavior. In other words, it makes you into a jerk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, time spent in, in a busy singles bar on a Friday evening will convince you 
of the truth of this. And in a way, it's no joke. I mean, I think probably for a thousand years, nobody got laid in Western civilization unless they were swacked because, uh, you know, people were so uptight on the natch, having imbibed this whole monotheistic moral trip, that unless they took a powerful drug which dissolved social inhibitions and empowered aggressive behavior, they weren't able to make a move. How many women, how many women can think back to their first sexual imprinting and realize that it occurred in an atmosphere of aggressive use of alcohol. I mean, this is almost the standard model. Maybe not so much anymore, but throughout the first five decades of this century, I think that would be a pretty fair statement. So, you see, drugs are like the invisible lenses through which we view reality. And no culture has been without them. It's just cultures accept some and repress others according to uh, their particular, the particular cultural values which are trying to be conserved. The reason this is not simply armchair speculation among anthropologists is because we now are the inheritors of a planet which is dying under anesthesia. Our entire cultural crisis is predicated on the fact that we cannot feel or connect with the consequences of our history, that we have behaved very badly, we of the high-tech societies, we have trashed gender relationships, we have trashed Aboriginal societies, we have cut down the rainforest, uh, we have robbed our own children of a future as rich as the future that we expect ourselves to enjoy. Uh, there isn't even a name for this sin where you destroy the opportunity of your own children. I mean, no society has been that perverse. And we're doing it under a massive infusion of alcohol laced with monotheistic moral propaganda. Well... What is the antidote to this? Well, it's what I call the archaic revival. It's something that's been going on throughout most of the 20th century, but with increasing depth and urgency.